So hello everyone. What we have considered until now so far are so-called autonomous ODEs. So for example, here in the linear case, we considered a system which is just defined by states, and we had considered the system response giving x0, so the initial state of the system as the only input to the system. However, in real world systems, especially in engineering systems, but also maybe in social systems and biological systems, we are normally are not able to directly measure the state x, right? So x is like the internal information, the internal state of our system. However, in order to obtain this information from the system and make it available to the outside world, we normally need sensors, some kind of sensor device, and therefore what we now introduce is a new variable here, which is the output variable y, and we consider these as the outputs or the measurements of the systems. So these are basically uh, maybe a combination or a subset or in some cases where we are maybe lucky even exactly the states, but it will be potentially different from the states. So it will be the information which we can basically get from the dynamic system by some kind of measurement. On the other side, Normally dynamic systems, or many dynamic systems, not all, but many, also have another opportunity to be excited except for the initial state. And this excitation or actuation can come by some inputs, which we just denote here as u. So u, for example, could be um, in one of the previous examples which we have seen, the pendulum example, where maybe some external force is also applied to the pendulum, for example, by a human being, or we have also discussed about the spring mass damper system, where maybe somebody externally dips on the mass. So some external input, some external actuation, which will basically manipulate the system. So therefore the dynamic system a term becomes a little bit more complex because we do not only have states but we also have inputs which we can excite and we have the outputs y which will be the measurements, the observables. And therefore we have to extend a little bit our model scope, our state space model scope and what we will add to this equation are a couple of more terms which is plus b times u of t in the linear case, so we first consider the linear case and then the nonlinear case. So that basically means that we have some inputs u of t that could be one up to m different inputs. So r to the power of m. And they will be linear mapped towards the state dynamics via this input matrix b, which is a matrix of n times m which will basically map the inputs, the m inputs, to the n state dynamics. Additionally on that, we also need to consider the outputs or the measurements, y of t, and because here on this side of the board we will just consider the linear case, this is then also a linear mapping, c times x of t. So here we consider r to the power of p different measurements. So this is basically R p times n matrix, which will map the states towards the measurements. But sometimes we also have a so-called feed-through, d times u of t. So d is a so-called feed-through matrix, p times m. If our inputs have a direct feed-through towards the outputs. What we can observe from this equation is that only the state equation is basically a dynamic equation considered a linear ODE. Our measurement equation on the other side is an algebraic, a static equation, because we do not have here any additional time dependency. We have just a one-to-one -one mapping for the same time points of x and u towards the measurement y of t, right? So this is a static or algebraic equation. This is a differential equation. What is a typical example for a linear state space equation with an input? 
Let's have one from the electrical engineering domain where I come from. And for this, we can consider a very simple uh, oscillatory circuit, a so-called RLC circuit. So we have a resistor R here. We have a capacitor C and we have an inductor L. And as an input, we consider some external voltage device, maybe a DC source, which we consider here as U of T. So this is our input voltage. And as states, this is now a definition, we consider the voltage across this capacitor as X1 of T. So this would be the voltage Vc. So the voltage as the capacitor. And as a second state, we consider the current. So that would be X2. And this is identical to IL of T. So this would be the current flowing through this inductor. And using a uh, basic principle calculus, we do not go here into a deep derivation. But what we will basically get from this is, again, our x dot of t, which is d dt x1 of t x2 of t. And then as a right-hand side, for this simple circuit, what we get is 0, 1 over C, so this is here the capacitor values, the so-called capacitance, minus 1 over L, which I did not write down until now. So L is the inductance, so the characteristic value of the inductor, and we get minus R over L. So this would be then here our A matrix. And we need to multiply this with X of T. And as an input, which is here our input voltage, we basically get an input vector, not a matrix, because we have just one input, which is 0, 1 over L times U of T. So this would be the state equation, state dynamic equation, this one, with a scalar input and an input vector. So this would be our B, this would be our A. Question is now, what can we measure? What are the interesting quantities here? We have basically two opportunities. We could measure the voltage at the capacitor or we could measure the current through the inductor. And more or less arbitrarily, I decide that today I would like to measure the voltage at the capacitor. So I consider Y of T being identical to X one of t, and if we denote this in this linear state space equation, what we basically get is 0, 1 times x of t. So this is a, this is b, this is c, and in this example we do not have any feed-through term because the uh, input voltage here will not lead to a direct change, an instantaneous change of the measured voltage at the capacitor. So in this example, what we basically have is a limited measurement. So we only have direct access to the capacitor voltage and we don't have any direct access to the inductor current. So this would basically a state which from the measurement point of view is unknown to us. We don't have direct access to that. So in one of the following videos, we will need to discuss if there's any opportunity by a mathematical model or by a mathematical method, which we maybe get indirect knowledge of this second state here, the inductor current, because if we cannot measure it, uh, we normally are still interested into the inductor current because the information of two, the two states are important for us. And if we are only able to measure one state directly, then it maybe makes sense to uh, estimate, so to get information about the other state. So this was an example for the linear case um, where we can describe the mapping from the inputs and the states towards the state dynamics and to the outputs in a linear fashion. But of course, as we have already discussed, the nonlinear uh, ODE, we can also extend that 
to a state space model with inputs and outputs. So for that, we can write x dot of t is equal to the right hand side x, x of t and u of t and y of t is g of x of t times u of t. So basically a generalized version of the linear kind uh, of uh, input output ODE here. We have still an ODE in a nonlinear fashion where now a second um, quantity comes into the game which is the input vector or the input depending if it's a vector or a scalar and the outputs so the measurements which are also like here in the linear case are basically just um, a static equation mapping potentially nonlinearly the axes and the u's towards the outputs. Also for this nonlinear state space ODE I would like to give a very short example more like from the biology kind of way which is the lotka volterra equation also known as the prey predator equation and for that we basically can postulate an equation from observations from let's say the real world, the physics or the biology with two states x1 of t, x2 of t and as I said this is also known as the predator-prey um, equation so x1 can be considered the density of the prey and x2 can be considered the density of the predators. And the right hand side of this equation in a classical way is some constant c1 times x1 of t minus c2 times x of 2 times x1 of t plus u of t and for the second state derivative we get c3 times x1 of t times x2 of t minus c4 times x2 of t. So what does this state equation basically tells us? We have four constants c1, c2, c3, c4. These are basically the constant describing the dynamics of the systems and we can see that we have here multiplications of x1, x2, here as well x1, x2, so this is why we don't, we are not able to represent this right hand side as a linear equation but it needs to be considered a nonlinear equation. This input u of t towards the prey density could be considered some external input from humans for example so if there is some feeding of the prey by humans this will obviously to an increase of the prey density which then over time can of course also have some impact on the predator density. As a measurement uh, in this case we could postulate that y of t so the measurement is just x1 of t again so motivation could be here that it's maybe dangerous to measure the density of the predators because they may be um, hostile to humans so they could potentially uh, attack biologists which try to measure the density so it is maybe safer to measure the density of the prey over time and then utilize some model knowledge trying to estimate the predator density over time. Also here this somehow abstract equation or the somehow uh, abstract right hand side give motivation to a data based identification of this model because these constants c1, c2, c3, c4 they cannot really be um, derived by first order principles as we have done it here in the um, electrical circuit way or previously with the spring mass damper but these are more like abstract parameters which could be identified based on observations from the field and that we then try 
to identify those based on data. So we have therefore seen that the systems with inputs and outputs are very important for many real-world applications like uh, engineering or biology, and therefore they also make a very important entry point for data-driven system identification as we will see in the subsequent videos. Thank you.